Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for that's those singing, the enthusiasm that you have today. It was really good. I also want to thank you for the phone calls and the cards and uh, the letters you got about me when I hurt myself. Believe me, it wasn't fun to hurt myself. My body is a little older than I think it is. Uh, we were moving the last uh, part of our uh, boxes out of the garage. I don't even know why we do that, because we've had them for three years in the garage and haven't used them. So, But I told Charlie, I'd move them over. I'll put them in the back of her car. I'll make a few trips. And so I did that all day Friday. And our son came over Friday night with a pickup truck. And so I moved a few more boxes with him, some of the heavier ones we did together. Then Saturday, I went back over there and worked till about noon and did that again. And then uh, Charlie and I worked on the PowerPoint uh, for the message. And about 4 o'clock, I sat down in my easy chair. And, and uh, about 6 o'clock, I tried to get up and couldn't. <laughs> my hip, not my back, my hip had kind of frozen up. I had strained the muscles there. And uh, it just wouldn't let me get up. It wouldn't let me take a step. And so I looked like a guy who weighed about, or looked like a guy who was 110 years old at that time. I couldn't even move. And uh, I crawled into bed and was in agony all night long. I finally called Ross about 6 o'clock in the morning and said, two things you need to know. I'm not going to be there today. <laughs> I, I'm in a lot of pain and I can't even walk up the aisle. So he said, okay, I can take care of it. And you know, Ross, I think uh, sometimes he does better on the fly than he does if we give him a week or two to repair, to repair. But he did a good job and I'm thankful for that and I knew he would. And I, uh, I put some ice on it all day Sunday and and I uh, got up Monday morning and could walk about 50% better. And then I uh, did the same thing on Monday. And by Tuesday, I was as good as new. So I was glad I healed pretty well there. And uh, last week, we were at annual conference. And then next week, Ross is on vacation next, this week. Next week, I'll be on vacation. I've healed just in time to go on vacation. Uh. <laughs> but we have Linda and Andy and Ross, and they're great preachers, and you'll have a good time with them. Won't have Gospel Sunday every Sunday, so I was privilege for today and glad for your enthusiasm. Would you pray with me? Loving God, thank you for the gift of this Sunday morning when we can come here and sing wonderful songs, sing our praises to you, and listen to the word that you would have for each of us this day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For each day that you give us to live, you are the strength we need, you are the rock that we stand on, and you are the one who has redeemed us in your Son, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen. If this uh, scripture passage looks familiar, it's the one I was going to do two weeks ago. <laughs> but it's a little different twist than what Ross had on it. Um, Simon was a well-to-do Pharisee. And uh, if you were a well-to-do Pharisee, you had a nice home. And you have a courtyard in it. And uh, this is kind of the home that Simon would have. Big home, you see the courtyard there in the middle, and then uh, you would also put a fountain in, and so there's a picture of a wonderful fountain there in the courtyard, some, looks something like that, and then off to the side in the courtyard were some tables, that you would, they were low-lying tables, and when you uh, got to these tables, you kind of stretched your feet out like that, and then kind of leaned on your left arm and kind of shared a meal, and you can see those who are gathering there for a meal. And then there's the woman at Jesus' feet. Simon, as he said, was well-to-do. He had this wonderful house, this, this fountain and courtyard. And uh, Jesus, by this time, was uh, getting a reputation as a well-known rabbi who had special skills and talents. And so Simon, who was a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees are those people that set themselves apart from the mainstream of life. They are those who dedicated themselves their whole lives to following all 600 and some rules that were in the Hebrew Scriptures, we call the Old Testament. Pharisees set themselves aside to follow those rules. They couldn't have any other job. They couldn't do any other thing. They just followed those rules. And so most of them were well-respected and well-thought of. And if, you know, Jewish belief was that if you did everything that God wanted you to do by those rules, God would bless you and you would prosper. And so here was Simon had this wonderful house and this fountain and uh, able to have, uh, have people come over. And so when Jesus came to town, Simon went to Jesus. And this is the scripture that I want to kind of read to you. It goes back to uh, a previous verse. 
It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to his home for a meal. Now, there are lots of reasons Simon might do that, uh, to entertain and just to learn more about Jesus, to see if he was a true prophet or a false prophet. And uh, Jesus accepted the invitation. And then he, you see him in the picture there. He sits down to eat. Now, Luke says, a certain immoral woman heard that he was there and brought a beautiful jar filled with expensive perfume. This woman had a reputation. Everybody in town knew who she was. She was a woman of the evening, and she had sinned a lot, and people knew it, but the place was, was open. And so she found her way in, and she knew that Jesus would be here, be there, and, and she wanted to get rid of her sins. And she thought, here was a person who could do that for her. And so she brought some a beautiful jar with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him. His feet were sticking out, so that was easy for her to do. She knelt behind him uh, at, at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now, Simon and the others, other distinguished gentlemen that were there, were watching all this. And Luke says, when the Pharisee, Simon, who was the host, saw what was happening, and who the woman was, he said to himself. He didn't say it out loud so Jesus could hear. He just said to himself these words. This proves that Jesus is no prophet. If God had really sent him, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Wow. Simon knew what everybody else knew. That if you were a religious leader, you had no business even coming near this person. And so here we have the picture of two religious leaders with quite... Simon the Pharisee who set himself out to follow every rule that was ever put down in the Old Testament to get closer to God. And Jesus, they don't know that. Just the disciples know that. He is the Son of God. And Simon wants to put distance between himself and the woman. But Jesus wants the distance to grow shorter and shorter. He wants to get to know this woman, and he wants to heal her. Two religious leaders, vastly different understandings of what righteousness is. Then, as if Jesus could read Simon's mind, he spoke up and answered the thoughts that Simon had. He said, Simon, I, I have something I want to say to you. So Simon says, okay, all right, teacher, go ahead. I'm all ears. I'm listening. So Jesus tells him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one. Just 50 pieces of silver to the other. Neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both. Canceling their debts. Jesus asked Simon this question then, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon's answer was easy. I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, said Jesus. And then he turned to the woman in front of Simon and the other men gathered there. He said, look at this woman, Simon. Just look at her. See, Simon despised the woman and wouldn't spend any time. But Jesus said, look, Simon, she's done for me what you refused to do. You were the host. And there's just some, some rites of hospitality that you should have done. When I came in the door, there should have been some, a cool cup of water to pour over my feet to wipe the dust off. That's just customary. And you didn't do it. 
But she, with her tears on my feet, she washed them with her hair. She took care of all the dust and dirt on my feet. And you, you didn't give me a kiss. It was customary, especially for a distinguished rabbi. When he came to your home, you would just put your hands on his shoulders and you would kiss him on the cheek and say, welcome to my home. Simon, you didn't even do that. And she has to stop kissing from my feet from the moment she got here. She's, she's kissed me and shown me love where you didn't. And thirdly, you were supposed to put a drop of, of soothing olive oil or some fragrance on my head. And she's had expensive perfume poured all over my feet. Simon, you, you didn't do any of these things. And she did them all. And he says, I tell you, her sins, and we know they're many, Jesus said. They are many. They've been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. I had a teacher once who always was saying there's two kinds of people in the world. And he would say there's these people and these people. And in this scripture passage, there are two kinds of people. Not comparing Jesus to Simon, the two religious leaders, but Simon to the woman. There are those people in the world who don't think they have any sin. None at all. And that was Simon. He followed all the rules. He did everything he was supposed to do. He was ahead of a righteous life but he didn't have a lot of love. And then there was the woman who had more sins than the average person, many more sins. But she had love in her heart and she wanted to be forgiven, and she was. Which is the greater sin? To know you are a very sinful person or to think you have no sin whatsoever? Mark Twain had a lot of sayings, but he said this, Everyone is a moon and has a dark side, which we never show anybody. Well, guess what? This woman's dark side was pretty obvious. She had a dark side and everybody knew it. But Mark Twain says, all of us have a dark side. Just most of us keep it hidden, sometimes even from ourselves. No one ever sees it. Righteousness is moving closer to those who have sin, not farther away. That's what Jesus had to teach. How many remember anything about a man in the early 1800s named Henry Clay? Anybody know him? Yeah, Jeff, you do. You must have read some history. Who was Henry Clay? Well, he was just a wonderful human being. 1977 was 1777 when he was born. 1852 was when he died. But what he did, God gave him this ability, unsurpassed ability for brokering differences. He found the middle ground. He soothed and consoled opposing passions into compromise and reconciliation. He did that for two presidents. You know, he ran for president and got defeated, but he became a senator and a statesman. And then John F. Kennedy in 1957 headed a committee with the task of honoring its most distinguished past members. They named Henry Clay the greatest senator in the country's history. Imagine that. The greatest senator in the history of our country. What a distinction that was. But he had a dark side. Not a lot of people knew about it. But he was over $40,000 in debt. In the early 1800s, that's 200 years ago, that was a staggering amount of money. Almost no human being could ever recover from that much indebtedness. He would have to sell everything he ever owned, and that wouldn't be enough. And it was crippling to him. And he was afraid people would find that out about him. He wouldn't become the distinguished senator of the history of the United States. But one day... He owed the money to the, a bank in Lexington, Kentucky. And one day, 
a man came in and said, how much does Henry Clay own? The banker said, it's over $40,000. The guy said, how much exactly? And the banker told him. And he wrote out a check for the whole amount. The banker said, whom shall I say is taking care of Henry Clay's debts? Just tell him some friends who love him are taking care of his debt. Here was a distinguished, very honorable man, very stoic. A heart of stone who was able to see both sides of things and negotiate. Let, helped our country out a great deal. And when he heard that his debt had been paid, he broke down and cried like a baby. You see, when you know how, how bad off you are, what great sins you have, and he had many sins, just like the woman had many sins, and somebody forgives him, you're going to break down and cry. That's what the woman did. That's what Henry Clay did. That's what Jesus does for all of us. The more we know we sin, the more we love Jesus for forgiving those sins. Jesus has one more thing to say to the woman. He looks at her and says, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace? Where is she going to go? She cannot go back to the street life she had before. She's given that up. Anybody she knew, her friends, she's given that up. They're not her friends anymore. She can't go back there. She can't go to Simon's house. She has this reputation as a sinner. She's going to have that reputation for a long time. Where can she go? And not only go, it says go in peace. Where is she going to find peace? That's where you and I come in, in this church. She needs a community of faith who understands that, that being righteous just isn't following the rules. Paul says in Galatians, I have come to fully understand. And he was a rule follower. You remember? His name was Saul, a rule follower. He was going after those that were breaking the rule, the Jewish rules, persecuting them. He said, I've come to understand that it's not following the rules that's going to get you to eternity. It's having faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? I hope that this is the church, that that's woman. You can hang out a sign all over the place. From the minute she comes into a parking lot, from the minute she sits down in the front pew to the, when she leaves out those doors, all signs that said, you are welcome here. All God's children, all sinners, everyone is welcome here. Amen.